da er det ganske mange inne i, I møtet, så da tror jeg vi setter i gang. Da skal jeg gi ordet til Bjørn Ravnestad, som er hovedarkitekt for en tydelig strekkoding i Helse Sør-Øst. For å nå målet om sporebarhet på tvers av virksomheter, forbedring av pasientsikkerhet og effektivisering i helsesektoren, må entydig identifisering og strekkoding til. Og Bjørn Ramstad vil nå fortelle oss om deres GS1-prosjekt i Helse Sør-Øst. Vær så god Bjørn, da kan du skru på mikrofonen og overta skjermen her. Takk for det Steffen. Jeg skal se om jeg får til å... Skal vi se sånn. Få til å dele her. Da håper jeg alle ser det her. Yes, flott. Fint å få det bekreftet. Ja, Bjørn Ramstad heter jeg, hovedarkitekt som Steffen sa. I dette prosjektet som heter Entydig strekkoding, GS1. Vi holder ikke på med bare strekkoder. Så jeg skal fortelle litt om dette prosjektet, hva vi holder på med. Og også litt om hvordan vi jobber med standardisering med GS1. Bakgrunnen for dette her er jo at Helse Sør-Øst allerede i 2016 besluttet at GS1 skal være en regional standard for automatisk identifikasjon og datafangst. Og det var jo flere grunner til at man tok en sånn beslutning, blant annet at man hadde flere løsninger der man hadde proprietære strekkoder og rett og slett litt utfordringer med det. Og så var det også det at allerede i 2016 så så man at det var flere regulativ og forordninger på vei som traff helsesektoren, både med hensyn til legemiddel og medisinsk utstyr som pekte på standarder som GS1 for identifikasjon og merking. Så har jo dette her gått fremover gjennom det ble startet opp et prosjekt med en konseptfase og en planfase. Nå er vi i en gjennomføringsfase. Så jeg skal komme litt inn på hva prosjektet består av nå. Og det er da tre delprosjekt som vi holder på med. Det første er en anskaffelse av GS1-komponenter. Og så har vi et delprosjekt med Proof of Concept. Og så har vi et delprosjekt for å utarbeide et målbilde for GS1 innen innkjøp og logistikk. Jeg tok med her ute til høyre, så ser dere en veileder for bruk av GC-standarder som kom i fjor fra Direktoratet for e-helse, som anbefalte bruk av GC-standarder for identifikasjon og sporbarhet. Det synes vi var veldig bra, så klart. Den anbefaler jo at alle tar en titt på. Det ligger ute på e-helse sine hjemmesider. Ja. Stil litt om del prosjekt 1, anskaffelse GCN-komponenter. Det dere ser her er jo et målarkitekturbilde som Helse Sør-Øst har utarbeidet, som på en måte gir en slags oversiktsbilde av byggeklosser og kapabiliteter, og hvordan de spiller sammen. Og det vi anskaffer inngår jo inn i det her prosjektet, bildet. Så vi anskaffer et lokasjonsregister, en grunndatatjeneste for informasjon om steder i regionen, rett og slett. Vi anskaffer et RFID-system som skal brukes til RFID-datafangst. Og så anskaffer vi en sporingsløsning, en hendelsesbasert sporingsplattform. Og det som er fellesnevneren for alle disse tre systemene er jo at de støtter GCN sine datastandarder og samhandlingsstandarder. 
Så det håller vi på med akkurat nu i, i disse dagar. Vi har også en del projekt som är en proof of concept. Og här håller vi på och prøve ut mye av den teknologien som vi håller på och anskaffe for att bygge kunskap og erfaring i, i regionen. Og vi har fått låne to etasjer i et nytt sykehusbygg i Tønsberg. Tønsberg-prosjektet hører til sykehuset Vestfold. Og der har vi fått lov å montere opp teknologi. Og det dere ser her er jo da en plan skisse, og så ser dere forskjellige aksesspunkt og antenner og ting og tang som, som vi har skrudd opp. Og så bruker vi dette her til å teste et sett med use case, altså test case, som dere ser ute til høyre her, for å se om vi klarer å få denne teknologien til å virke, om vi klarer å bygge integrasjonene, og, og på en måte dekke de use casene som vi, som vi har beskrevet. Vi har hatt mye dialog med helseforetakene om disse her use casene, og det er klart at vi har et use case der 1.6, for eksempel, sporing av utstyr. Det er kanskje litt liten skrift, ikke så enkelt å se. Sporing av utstyr er jo en veldig sånn generisk use case, og det kan være snakk om veldig mye forskjellig utstyr som skal spores. Så for fra et helseforetak sin side, så, så er det kanskje at de har fokus på sporing av senger, eller det kan være sporing av rullestoler, eller det kan være sporing av transportvogner eller lastbærere som brukes til forfellige ting. Så har vi et delprosjekt 3, der vi jobber med et målbilde for GCN, innkjøp og logistikk. Og her har jo tanken vært at vi på en måte skal jobbe fram hvordan vi skal bruke GCN innen innkjøp- og logistikkområdet og, og forankre det i regionen. Og ja, dere ser den skissen under her, og den viser jo på en måte et perspektiv fra produsent til patient. Produsenten er ute til venstre her, og så er det en forsyningskjede eller en verdikjede som går helt fram til sykehuset og, og inn til pasienten. Så vi, vi ser jo der på da, hva er det slags grunndata og transaksjoner som man trenger for å oppnå sporbarhet, effektivitet og automatisering og kontroll, og hvordan da GCN-standardene kan, kan bidra her. Så her kan man jo tenke for eksempel medisinsk utstyr, implantater, ikke sant? Hvordan kan du på en måte få sporbarhet gjennom hele forsyningskjeden her helt fram til pasient uten at det blir alt for mye fragmenterte løsninger og ja, dupliserte data og manuelt arbeid da, for å få til sporbarheten som man ønsker. Her spiller jo innkjøp og logistikk også en, en rolle. Så har vi inngått en avtale med GCL Norway som gir da regionen tilgang til å bruke GCN-standardene. Og det handler om både at vi tar i bruk GLN, altså Global Location Number, altså lokasjons-ID-standarden til GCN, men også at helseforetaket selv kan utstede sine ID-er for sine ting. Og det gjelder jo både identifikatorer for utstyr, men også for, for produkt som foretakene produserer. Og her kan det være forskjellige ting, både mat og sterilvarer, og for så vidt også tilvirkning og omppakking av, av legemiddel. Så jeg har lagt ved en link her til en sak som, som omhandler dette her på Helse Sørøst sine nettsider, så kan man gå inn og, og lese mer om det her. OS, Oslo universitetssykehus, de har jo kommet lengst kanskje med dette arbeidet. 
de håller på nå och konfigurera upp sin nya steril försörjningslösning. Och där brukar de GCN-standarder på på alla områder som de kan både i förhåll till att identifiera sterilt flygångsutstyr och lastbärare men också lokationer som de ska leverera sterilvara till. Så så det är väldigt väldigt spännande. Där har jag lagt en länk så du kan gå och läsa mer om det arbete som förgår där. Vi är ju med och stöttar det projektet. Yes. Så ska jag se si lite om standardisering med GSN i hälsoröst, hur vi jobbar med med det. Och uh, lite kedlig kanske, men uh, det är en god del dokumentproduktion. Vi uh, vi lager tekniska profiler, vägledare och arkitekturer som kan stötta och hjälpa hälsoföretagen när de ska ta i bruk GCN-standarderna på olika områden. Och hälsoföretagen har ju olika behov och olika fokus på, på vad de önskar lösa och ta tag i först och sist. Och vi bistår ju då med att med och utarbeta för exempel vägledare då för hur de praktiskt ska göra ting på ett gitt bruksområde. Så, så det är en viktig del av av arbetet till projektet. Eh, väldigt många av dessa dokumenten här ligger publicerat ute på Hälsoröst sin nettsida nå. Så så där är det ju bara att gå och se. Eh, och måten vi lager dessa här dokumenten på då det är ju att vi vi tar utgångspunkt i de internationella standarderna och vägledarna som GSN har utarbetat. Och så tillpassar vi det för för vårt formål. Men men inte på en sån måte att vi bryter med de internationella standarderna, men översätter till norsk och sätter in i en norsk kontext. Um, ja, så den skissen här illustrerar ju hur när vi har ett eller annat bruksområde, uh, att vi lagar en vägledare för bruksområde och att en slik vägledare kan referera till tekniska profiler i förhåll till vad slags streckkoder och då ska man implementera uh, praktisk. Och i någon tillfälle så så lager vi också referensarkitekturdokument där det är behov. Um, ja, och så det som är väldigt uh, intressant med med GSN då. Det är detta här med det, det digitala och och det fysiska. Och uh, det vi ser är ju att uh, klinisk flyt och materiell flyt konvergerar. Och vad menar vi det? Den skissen ute där är med att illustrera, inte sant, att du har en klinisk flyt där något föregår i förhåll till patientbehandling. Du rekryterar något, det ska valideras, du ska förbereda och så ska du kanske transportera det fram till patienten, administrera och du du följer upp och övervakar det du det var gjort eller brukt på patienten. Men på ett steg här så, så, så kommer liksom det materiella in i förhåll till att uh, försörjningslogistiken, alltså var försörjning eller steril försörjning eller vad det nu handlar om, kommer in och träffar den, uh, den kliniska flyten. Och uh, det här uh, ska hänga samman för att få till få till sporbarhet då helt tillbaka till 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 producent. Och traditionellt så 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 har ikke det hängt väldigt gott samman. Och det det är fortsatt en del att att jobba med här. Ehm ett exempel här då för att försöka och bara illustrera detta här området kan vara läkemedel. Så jag brukar den samma skissen här i förhåll till att vi har en läkemedelproducent ute till till 
Venstre, og, og vi ønsker egentlig å følge legemiddelet gjennom hele kjeden her, helt fram til patienten har fått en medicin og å ha sporbarhet på hvilket legemiddel, hvilken batchlot, serienummer er det patienten ender opp med å få. Og her er det da flere standarder og informasjonsstandarder som, som kommer in og, og treffer. I det MP er jo den nye informasjonsstandarden for legemiddelinformasjon. Du har GS1 for merking og identifikasjon av legemiddelproduktforpakninger. Og så har du PEPOL EOF-standarden for elektronisk handel. Den kommer jo inn i forhold til å bestille, levere og fakturere legemiddel i verdikjeden her. Og inne på sykehuset så, så bruker du kanskje H7, Fire og Snowman CT som, som de kliniske standardene for, for legemidler som forordnes og virkestoff og så videre. Og som vi ser da så er det på en måte en overgang i forhold til, til e-handel og det kliniske. Men GC1 er på en måte en, en rød tråd her da som kan binde sammen og skape den sporbarheten som, som, som vi trenger her, og som vi ønsker å oppnå. Så, og vi ønsker å oppnå på det, det på en effektiv måte. Så, så, så det er jo litt det vi, vi ser hen til og prøver å, å få til her da. Um, avslutte med det her. Um, Litt sånn som jeg sa på forrige slide her, det er ikke en standard som dekker alle behov. Helsesrøst ønsker å basere seg på internasjonal beste praksis når vi velger standarder innen ulike bruksområder. Og til høyre her så, så ser dere et white paper som kom ut i fjor fra noe som heter IHE, Integrating the Healthcare Enterprise. Og de uh, er jo en viktig organisasjon i forhold til å utarbeide sånne her standardiseringsprofiler. Og her har de da kommet nå uh, egentlig og begynt å adressere at uh, det her med supply of products, altså vareforsyning til helse, faktisk uh, begynner å bli ganske viktig å ta tak i for å klare å få til sporbarhet for å få et riktig datagrunnlag eh, rundt eh, hva er det vi bruker på pasientene i pasientbehandlingen. Så, så det anbefaler jeg jo at eh, man tar en titt på. Og der pekes det også til, til GSN-standardene. Så det var det jeg hadde tenkt å si sånn innledningsvis. Så da er det bare å komme med spørsmål hvis man har noen. Tusen takk for det, Bjørn. Har det kommet inn noen spørsmål der til Bjørn? Det har ikke kommet inn noen spørsmål enda, men det er fortsatt bare å skrive inn, så kan vi ta det. Ja. Skal vi se. Ser dere spermen min nå? Ja. Da skal da får vi ta noen spørsmål senere hvis det kommer noen inn til Bjørn. Men takk for veldig bra introduksjon for, til temaet, Bjørn. I neste presentasjon vil Mark Songhurst, Program Lead for Scan for Safety hos Leeds Teaching Hospital i UK, fortelle om hvilke gevinster de har realisert ved bruk av GSN-standarder hos deg. Så so, over til you, Mark. Please turn on your microphone and start to share your presentation. Excellent. Thank you, Stephen. And my first thing is I apologize that this will be in English, not Norwegian. Um, hopefully one day I will be able to speak enough Norwegian to be able to actually give my presentation in the right language. So let me just start by sharing my screen. And I'm now hoping that everybody is able to see my screen. Yes, so, 
Excellent, thank you. So, hello, my name is Mark. I am the project manager and program lead for Scan for Safety here at Leeds Teaching Hospitals NHS Trust. To give you an idea of where we are in, Le in Leeds, Leeds is in the north of England. Um, we run seven hospitals at Le across Leeds. Um, so we have two major sites, which is St James's University Hospital and Leeds General Infirmary. We see about 1.1 million outpatients every year. Uh, we have 220,000 accident and emergency attendances and 120,000 inpatients every year. These figures were, of course, before COVID. COVID has changed all that demographic. Um, we are one of the largest trusts in the country. We account for 1% of the entire Department of Health budget and have a turnover of about £1.3 billion. Um, we are a multi-trauma centre for large parts of the north of England, so that means lots of our patients are unplanned and have complex needs. We are also the UK's only specialist hand transplant centre. We're also part of a wider scheme. So not only do we do our work as our own hospital, we link with hospitals across our region. Um, and that is known as the West Yorkshire Association of Acute Trusts, uh, where we link with hospitals in local towns such as Halifax, Huddersfield, Bradford, Wakefield, and all the way up to Harrogate. So we can actually obtain some real benefits by working together as a hospital organisation. So what are the um, drivers for what we did with Scan for Safety? In 2010, when the PIP implant scandal hit uh, the UK and we were required to check which breast implants we had used at Leeds, it took us over eight months to do the recall. Um, the reason for that is, as you can see on the right hand side of my slide, the picture of a theatre book. Theatre books were designed for when patients got one or maybe two implants. They now have multiple implants and the theatre book hasn't changed. All of these records needed to be searched by hand before we could confirm whether we'd even had that product in stock. In 2013 in the UK, it was discovered that um, beef burgers primarily and any minced beef contained an element of horse meat. This was reported nationally in the media and within two hours, retailers had removed all their stock from their shelves. So by the time mid-morning had come, retailers were in a really good position to say to people, anything that is affected has been removed. In 2014, the Department of Health uh, launched the e-procurement strategy. And as part of that, it created the GS1 and PEPOL adoption scheme. So Global Standards 1 and Pan-European Public Procurement Online adoption. And what they did was they looked for demonstrator sites across England to see if you could adopt these standards and if you can make improvements. The sites that were picked ranged all the way from a very small hospital down in Salisbury um, to large general hospitals at Derby and Plymouth, up to ourselves as a specialist centre. If we look at national statistics in the UK, there were between April 2020 and the 31st of August, 2020, 115 never events. These are events that should not have happened. Um, they are caused by human error and could have been prevented. When we look at these, actually 86 of them could have been prevented by using scan for safety techniques. So there is a huge need for being able to do this. And even at Leeds, where we have scan for safety implemented, we are finding more and more cases where actually scan for safety could have minimised or prevented harm to a patient. So if we work up our building blocks, starting at the bottom, 
we have the National E-Procurement Strategy, the GS1 and PEPL adoption program, and the selection of the six demonstrator sites. As demonstrator sites, we were asked to do six tasks, which are in orange. We were asked to be able to identify all places with a GLN or global, ex uh, global location number. We were asked to be able to identify all our patients that are requiring treatment with a global service relationship number or GSRN and to be able to identify products used for patients with a global trade item number. Once we had those building blocks in place, we were then to roll out inventory management, product recall and PEPOL. The sections in green are the bits that we needed to happen within the organisation. So we needed clinical and executive support and we got that from our Deputy Chief Medical Officer who was given an executive role for Scan for Safety. He reported directly to the Hospital Trust Board and ensured that Scan for Safety was seen within the organisation. He also made sure that the Trust Board spent time with the programme to understand the potentials that we had. And we were very lucky that um, not only did we get time with our own Trust Board, but as we've developed the scheme, the Trust Board wanted to demonstrate this to other people within government. So we've had our Permanent Secretary of State for Health visitors, we've had the Cabinet Secretary, and we've also had the Secretary of State for Health uh, Matt Hancock visitors in Leeds to see what we're doing. All of this publicity led to getting clinical buy-in and for Scan for Safety, having our clinicians on board is really important. Once we've got all those building blocks, at that point we can bring Scan for Safety into full use in our organisation. So just to recap, here are the GS1 standards that we use here at Leeds. So we have the GSRN, the Global Service Relationship Number for Patients, the PLACE, which is the GLN, and the Global Trade Item Number. They are the primary uh, standards we use. And you'll notice now that in the bottom corner of your slides, you will see those symbols appear uh, to help you through the bits that we're talking about. So every patient in our organization, as they are admitted, receives a wristband and on that wristband is the GS1 number for that patient and that relates to their NHS number. It also contains all the other demographic details. So as you can see here, whether they are a newborn baby, they are a patient admitted through um, turning up for surgery, a patient that is brought into an assessment unit or a patient that comes into our accident and emergency teams, even via helicopter, as soon as we can identify them, they have a wristband on that has a GS1, GSRN on the wristband. All of our um, rooms in the hospital have allocated a global location number. This allows us to be able to track things to specific locations that are globally unique. So here are the two plaques that relate actually to my office. So the one on the left that says scan here for your location is inside the room. Inside that is an RFID chip. So if we ever decide to expand to using RFID technologies, we can do so. The plaques inside the room will be eventually used by our estates teams to log into rooms to say they have come to do work in that specific area. We also repeat that plaque on the door. That is available for security and our supplies team. If we were an operating theatre, we might not be able to get into the operating theatre to put something away because of, say, an airlock for surgery. What we would then need to do is leave it outside, but we then have a barcode available for those members of the staff. You will also see that we have labelled the room that you are about to enter on the door. This allows staff to track exactly where they need to be visually and gives them a very easy code. That code relates to the layers of data, which if you scanned the global location number and opened it up, 
in any of our databases, you would get that information back. That works really well at tracking people to a room. Unfortunately, as we know in healthcare, there are not every patient has access to a single room for themselves. So what we need to do is be able to identify further down to a treatment space. And this was a challenge for us at Leeds, defined by our Deputy Chief Medical Officer. So now all our bed spaces, our treatment spaces and our diagnostic spaces have a global location number with an extension that allows us to see exactly where a patient has been staying. And we'll come on to how this looks in the organization and how these are used later. When we started to look at catalog management, one of our problems is that each supplier used to define their own catalog number, their manufacturer's part code. And here we see three manufacturer's part codes from three different suppliers. They are all the same part code, but relate to three very different products. And this is a problem in your supply chain. If you have the same manufacturer's part code, it is very easy in the process for it to be changed and for the wrong product to be delivered. And especially when you use wholesalers, this becomes even more confusing. So we have adopted GTINs into everything that we do here at Leeds. And the GTIN allows us to drive a unique identif identifier for those products. It allows us to have inventory management and inventory management works on varying levels here at Leeds. So if we start in the bottom left hand corner, the lady in green is one of my colleagues, Denise. She works on the wards, providing a stock for the ward to use. Our materials management team, as we call them, go onto the ward, check what stock is needed, order it, come back two days later, once it's arrived in the hospital and put it away. This allows our nursing staff to know that if they need anything, they can reach out, put their hands in the drawers and take the items that they need. If there's anything specialist that they need or they're running short on a particular item, they have somebody to talk to. In the middle of the screen, we have our current inventory system. It's called uh, Powergate, and that is across 42 of our operating theatres in the organization. It allows us to scan products to patients uh, by recording the NHS number extracted from the GSRN. We also have in the top left um, some RFID cabinets. So we use RFID for items that are of high value and high value stock. And we will come on to one of the important learnings later that even with RFID, we need to be careful. And on the right hand side of my slide, you will see we are now moving to a new inventory system um, that has some clear benefits. It is an interoperable system, so we are able to already pull in patient details from our patient administration system into the um, inventory system so that we can record items used against a patient. This allows us to achieve paper-free inventory. So we work with our clinicians to decide what needs to be in the computer as products. We then set up and label the storerooms. Once those storerooms are set up, they are put onto the computer system and all the information is added for products in there, whether that is top-up, so items that we use regularly, needles, swabs, that we wouldn't scan, or whether that is an inventory piece such as a stent. Our clinical team's involvement is to take the right product from the shelf, take it into the operating theater, and scan that product against a patient. Once that has been completed, the checks will be carried out by the inventory management team, and the electronic order goes off to the manufacturer for a replacement, as that arrives back in, we put it away and the entire process starts again. There is no paper involved and that is anywhere across our systems. So even one-off items can be ordered electronically. 
when we look at a patient journey, our patient journeys can be very complex. So on this slide, you see four floors of our hospital in two, of our hospital in two different wings. And this is a, patient, uh, a journey that a breast patient regularly has to make before they have surgery. They are often unaccompanied, and so we give them rough directions. So as you can see, they go and have imaging done. They then have to go to the lift, up a level, across into another building, down a level in the lifts, to a reception desk, and then to an area to have dye applied as well. Once that has happened, they need to make that journey in return. And what used to happen was we used to lose our patients in that journey because they'd maybe make breast imaging, but then they'd get lost en route to have the dye fitted. So we needed to do something different. So we started to be able to combine the standards. We took the global location number of where a patient was and the global service relationship number, the wristband for that patient, and scanned the two and created a link. This is done inside our electronic health record of the hospital, so it becomes part of the patient's care record. This allowed us instantly to see this on a whiteboard in the ward. So the ward could look where all their patients were and see which patients were in which locations. We can also then look specifically at what time a patient arrived in which area. We were able to see the time, the location, who scanned, and also the global location number that that was assigned to. And this allowed us to see a patient coming into the waiting area, going to the breast imaging unit, coming back into the waiting area, into the anaesthetic room, into theatre, into recovery and then into a bed space. This all appears on the whiteboard so staff know exactly where they are. They also um, could then relay this information to a patient relative. Patient relatives are asked to leave once the patient is admitted for surgery and when they go to theatre it used to be a black hole. Now a nurse can turn around, look at the whiteboard when a relative rings up and give an exact location for that patient and expected times. So if the patient is in recovery, we can say, by the time you've put your shoes on and come to the hospital, your relative will be back on the ward. So our relatives like this because they know, we know where their patients are, and our patients like this because they get the interaction from the hospital staff, always checking where they are, talking to them, and scanning their wristband. It's done very much as part of the care of that patient. That information can then be extracted because we know where our patients are and we are now able to see a live bed state for the organisation. So we know which beds currently have patients assigned to them. This means that we can plan far more effectively where our patients are, what space we have available and as you can see here on the right hand side, it tells us why certain beds are closed. So we can actually go look at those that say closed and specified and see if it's just, for example, we haven't got enough nurses working that day to open that bed bay. If so, can we find extra nursing staff to be able to do so? It will allow us in future to be able to track patients and prevent infections. We will know which patients have been in the same room for a period of time and our infection prevention teams will be able to track them. But what about our products? This is a rather complex slide. So we start at the top left hand corner. A patient requires surgery, so they see the clinician and we decide which kind of implant might be required as part of their surgery or which procedure is re required and this is entered into the appropriate clinical system. That information is extracted and put into the patient administration system and we also put the procedure code in. That information is passed to the theatre scheduling system 
and that then allows us to plan that operation into the theatre schedules. This information will be fed into our new inventory system. So we already have the patient administration system and earlier this week at our programme board we gave permission for the expenditure to happen so that the theatre scheduling system will also integrate with the inventory system. This will allow us then to start preparing pick lists of what is required. You will notice that coming down into the inventory system as well is all the information on products from the catalogue. Once we've been able to pick the items that are needed for that procedure, um, we will do things like place an implant greater or smaller than the one required so that that is available. Patients are then admitted for surgery. They come into the operating theatre and we scan those items to the patient that we are used and that decreases what we hold on inventory. Items that are not used will be returned to the procurement team and put back on the shelf. From all this information that we gather, we will be creating a link to our electronic health record. This means that not only will clinicians be able to see which implants were used and which items were used for a particular piece of surgery, but here in Leeds, we will be able to then feed that through to a person's local doctor or GP, general practitioner in the UK and potentially even if we get the systems all lined up through to the patient. So a patient can see the electronic record of their procedure but also see what implants they've had. So should we have a PIP implant um, problem again, um, they would be able to see their own records and go, actually, I'm not affected by that. The financial information from the transactions is transferred to the general ledger. So we are able to accurately cost our procedures and make sure the expenditure is recorded. The information also goes to the hospital costing team so that we can talk to our clinicians about waste. So here at Leeds, we don't talk about cost savings anymore in healthcare. We talk about waste and about variation. So we talk to our clinicians about which is better. Um, the option to um, use one piece of kit, so one set of sutures or two, which gives the better clinical outcome that may mean that we don't see a patient again or that procedure doesn't require happening again. So we can look and understand what waste we need. We're hoping to work with the national register and take that implant information and add it automatically to the national register. This will save our clinical teams and admin teams time logging on and transferring the information. And finally, our procurement team. Once that item has been used, it is taken off inventory. As the stock levels fall, our inventory system will realise that we need to order more and more are ordered. This means that the next time a clinician wants one of those items, it will be there on the shelf for them to pick and use without any worry. We also use scan for safety in our clinical environments as well. So we use scan for safety to do blood tracking and fating to the patient. This reduces the error in cross matching in our hospital because people are no longer manually labeling uh, tubes at the start of the process. We are picking the right, we are getting the right blood in the right tube for the right patient to be cross-matched. This then allows us to use automatic fridges for dispensing blood and we are able to um, scan some barcodes from the patient to open up a local blood fridge and give the patient the right cross-matched blood. This is really important. It speeds up the process. It also means that we don't waste blood anymore by it being left in inappropriate storage settings. The other thing that we are using GS1 standards for is we're using them for tracking advanced therapies. These are times when we take a patient's white cell, we extract them, we ship them to a laboratory, the white cells are modified, they come back via a transport network to the hospital. We store them until the patient is ready for 
receiving the white cells back. And at that point, um, the treatment can then begin to work on cancer cells. This gives us a complete change of custody as to where medicine has been stored and the time that it will go in there. We're able to stop some of those never events. So we had a liver transplant patient who um, lost out on a liver transplant because a wrong blood, uh, wrong temperature reading was placed in their records. We introduced scan for safety so that now to get to that part of electronically cord recording a patient's temperature, you have to check the wristband is on the right patient and then you scan the patient to um, access their observations. This means that we get the right details in the right patient. We can manage our catalogues and inventory far better. So from here, you can see that 86% of our uh, inventory has a GTIN attached to it, and that accounts for 44% of our catalogue. There are lots of items in our catalogue that do not require GTINs, for example, electricity, um, contracts, and things like that. So that's why the number is lower in the catalogue. We can see in the previous 30 days how many implantable devices we have assigned to patients. We can see the uh, number of lines we've assigned to a patient, the cost of patients. Uh, we can also see at the bottom how many products we have that are about to go out of date and how many expired products we have in the trust. This is really important for us because we can manage our inventory, make sure that we don't lose stock of going out of date. So some of the benefits, um, the stock on the left came out of the RFID cabinets, and I said I would come back to them. The RFID cabinets were used by the clinical teams to say whether an item was in there or not. Nobody managed the stock to make sure it didn't go out of date. Um, they have done this work. We have removed out-of-date stock, and the out-of-date stock, even in an RFID cabinet, was £126,000. What we have done now to reduce that is we have introduced inventory managers whose role it is to manage the stock. We then are able to gain some soft benefits, such as reputation, become a hub of learning. Um, we're able to standardise our stock because of this. We're able to increase patient-level costing and increased clinical practice. So we're able to look at our financial savings from this. And this was whilst we were a demonstrator site. Um, currently, we are not um, recording the financial benefits because this is business as usual. So we were able to reduce stock by 1.7 million across the organization using Scan for Safety. Um, we had £150,000 of efficiency benefits, making sure staff were in the right place with the right equipment. Um, we were able to save £85,000 nearly on making sure product recalls worked smoothly. So I'm going to play a video, hopefully, that shows you just how smooth these processes can be. This is a patient transfer. So. This is from our implementation team. So this is our electronic health record. And once a member of staff signs on, what we ask them to do is to identify their patient, to check their wristband, and use the barcode then to open the patient record. This is a test patient. We scan the barcode, it opens up the record. We're then wanting to update the patient location because we've transferred them from one ward to another. As we do that, we click update location. This comes up and then this is in demo. So this is actually done at somebody's desk. But as you saw then, we just very quickly scan the patient bed space location. And it says, would you like to transfer the patient? If it is a new ward, you would click yes. And this brings up the details. So you can see here, we've got the date of the transfer, the time of the transfer, 
which ward and which bed this patient is going to and who their consultants are. If we need to make any changes, we can do. Um, so we can change, actually they're not in the bed we thought we scan, or actually we need to change their consultant, we can do that. We click transfer, and this is now going away to the main patient administration system and writing that detail. At this point, it comes back and we have updated all of our systems. This allows us to get that real-time benefit of this is where our patients are using GS1 standards. Our product safety recall, we have gone from huge numbers of books to a smart sheet that people can see all the details from. So let's look at this in real life. In December 2019, we had a recall on breast implants uh, because a manufacturer lost their CE markings. And within one hour, 45 minutes, we were able to get our notification into the trust, remove all those products from the shelves, check that the products weren't being used in surgery, and then confirm to the Deputy Chief Medical Officer and Medical Director Operations that those products were in quarantine. So that is a very brief overview of um, Scan for Safety. So thank you for your time and thank you for listening. Thank you, Mark. And uh, great to see all the, the benefits uh, that you have using uh, GS1 standards in your hospitals. Uh, are there any questions for Mark in the chat? Yes, it is. It is one from uh, Bjorn Dahlstam. And has it been difficult to get suppliers to use uh, GTNs for their products, Mark? Uh, lots of medical suppliers have actually been really good at starting to use GTNs. Uh, so the healthcare industry and health technology have GTNs as standard. Um, the difficulties we've had is uh, glo the global market. So we can receive the same product from, say, the Middle East market and the European market, and it have a different GT on um, because of the way in which they produce and manage that. Um, so what we've had to do is adapt and change our inventory system so that it will store more than one GT in for a product. So where we end up with two products from different locations, the inventory system can still read both and assign it appropriately. So we are getting that buy-in from industry. Great. Yeah. That was Thank it. you. Uh, does anyone have any other questions for, for Mark? Okay, so a question around um, GDPR. Just let me look at the question in full. Um, and patient tracking. Um, so patient tracking is something that we do anyway. Um, it is a standard part of healthcare, so it is already data that we would hold and we would use. So the system is internal to the trust and we make sure that nobody else can log in and see that data. So there is actually very little impact on GDPR because it is essential for us to manage that healthcare uh, need of the patient. Thank you. If you have any other questions for Mark, um, you can also email us and, uh, and we will uh, try to answer those questions uh, later. Okay, then I think we are, uh, are uh, done for, for now, uh, if there are no other questions. So thank you again, Mark. Uh, thank you so much for being here with us. It was great My to pleasure. hear about thank you. Yeah, okay. So now I'm going to turn back to Norwegian. Um, så da gjenstår det bare å si takk for uh, oppmerksomheten. Tusen takk for nå.